Alright, so I wanted to start this video off by saying I'm not trying to bash on anyone. This isn't me saying, no, you can't read anything because you don't know this, this, and this, and this. I just want to make sure that um, if reading is happening, that it's happening safely and correctly, both for the benefit of you, the fish, and for the hobby itself. So uh, let's. Look, I'm going to start off by saying we need more people like you. Uh, we need people that are dedicated and that are willing to put in the time to produce a good hardy fish. Uh, number one, it makes them more uh, common in the pet trade, which means that we can leave uh, wild populations alone, that we no longer have to import them here. Um, two, um, it gives the rest of the, the beginner hobbyists a hardier fish, something that they can really experiment with without having to get uh, live food or having to do anything special to to make sure that they're at least stressed. So everyone's just at least stressed in the end. All right, so if you don't know who I am, um, I'm Dex. Um, I'm in charge of maintenance right now. I was in charge of breeding, but it was mostly inverts and I have uh, helped out Daniel, which spearheaded our beta department. I say department, but it was a, it was a little small. So I have for a bit of firsthand experience with breeding betas. So I just really wanted to get a perspective uh, from the company. Um, I'm going to be talking about sales and how we did with that and um, I'm going to be asking Daniel some questions about why he decided that it wasn't it was a good idea to stop and um, not go ahead and continue breeding betas and I'm going to try to just give my best uh, account of you know the five questions that we asked and um, just to give kind of like a basis to make sure that um, we're breeding safely and everyone's getting taken care of. All right, so we're gonna answer our first question. Um, what's your purpose? Essentially, are you breeding to get some some seasons under your belt? Essentially, are you trying to become a better breeder, a better aquaculturist? So are you trying to breed something easier to get into the really fancy stuff later? Essentially for experience and for personal growth or are you trying to make money? Are you trying to make a profit? Or is this something that you're wanting to do like as a side gig? And once you've established that purpose, hopefully you have good intentions, we can go ahead and start answering the rest of these questions. Once you've established your purpose, you can move over to your second question, which is, do you have room? Essentially, you would need a 10 gallon for your female beta, a 10 gallon for your male beta, a five gallon where breeding will actually take place and a 40 gallon as a fry grow out tank. So that's just what you need to get started on breeding. And once you uh, breed, you were successful, maybe you got really lucky and you got 30 fish. How are you going to house these 30 fry once they start growing up and start uh, getting a little bit feisty with each other? Do you have the space? Uh, do you have the resources to keep all of those betas warm, fed, and can you keep up with those water parameters? And we'll get into that in a little bit later. But just make sure that you have room ten gallon, uh, to 10 gallons, a 5.5 gallon, and a 40 gallon is a lot of space. Not to mention you'd probably need a, a sponge filter to uh, filter the tank with the fry since you don't want them getting sucked up into just a regular hang-on back filter. Um, heaters for each of the tanks. You need to have a certain um, uh, heat to... Uh, probably high 70s just to keep the betas happy. So that's already one, two, three, four, that's already four heaters. Uh, you'd probably have to get pretty high up in the wattage on those to keep them pretty warm. Um, there's that and there's also feeding. Are you able to be, a, are you going to be able to feed all of these betas um, once they're there? Um, and are you gonna be able to take care of them? Which kind of leads us to question number three. So question number three is essentially, can you keep up with the water parameters and maintenance? What does that mean? So essentially like here, um, our tap water is really hard. It clocks in at 8.5 and um, for betas, you wanna have a softer water. So whenever we bred betas here, Daniel said that he had a lot of issues keeping that pH down, uh, whether it be buying just pH down, which can get a little pricey for 40 gallons, uh, I guess it would be 65 gallons that you would need for just one pair of breeding betas So that's a lot of pH down a lot of mulch a lot of softener pillows that we had to do on our end 
I'm not quite sure of the water parameters uh, where you live, but maybe you just have more ideal water parameters. And are you, are you just going to be able to keep up with the maintenance? Can you keep nitrates and nitrates down? Can you handle ammonia spikes? Can you keep everything stable for them to be able to actually breed, grow, and be healthy? And once you've answered those, you can move on to question number four, which is, am I sacrificing their quality of life? Um, typically, I would ask these questions with fish that are prone to disease, which giant betas are. They're more susceptible to bacterial diseases. They have a shorter lifespan. Um, if you're trying to work with the morphs to kind of get a healthier fish, that's kind of a bit of an exception. You're trying to purposefully call out um, the bad ones, which is another thing. Um, are you prepared to deal with loss? Um, and I know whenever we fed or uh, whenever we bred some fish, you know, some were just not fit. Um, genetics played a big role. Uh, some of them were just not going to live for very long. Some of them were more uh, susceptible to diseases. And you have to make a tough call. I mean, what do you do with the fish that you can't sell, but you can't keep? But going back to our question, um, so stuff like Dalmatian liar tails, like the, the mollies, those, I don't know why they're still in the hobby. They they die easily. They're not hardy. They're pretty, but it's just they're not adding anything positive to the hobby. Um, stuff like balloon mo uh, balloon mollies as well. They're really pretty. Uh, very vulnerable to disease. They they out they die off really quickly. Not a hardy fish. Essentially, just no help uh, to the hobby at all. Um, same kind of with the giant betas. We had a lot of die off just for. Um, bacterial disease uh, diseases and with just a short lifespan. So just keep in mind that that's something you're going to have to combat. And if you're really dedicated to keeping, um, trying to get a hardier fish, like I said first, good for you. I mean, the like I said in the beginning, people need, uh, we need more people like you to create that hardier fish. And I know I kind of got into the final question, which is, are you uh, prepared to deal with loss, which essentially covers uh, culling so anything, so if you have just all of these babies, but you're only breeding for the prettiest red out of all of them, what are you going to do with the blues or the greens? You know, what are they happening? Are you um, selling them at a lower price as a B grade, if you will? Are they going to become a feeder fish for something else? Are you going to euthanize them? Which I do not recommend. There's no um, way to euthanize fish at home while being humane, um, unless you're just feeding them to your turtle, which... Again, it's a great area, but that's the great thing about aquatics is there's so much um, room and we're all learning so much every single day and you might discover something that we don't know. But um, are you prepared to deal with loss? Um, are you prepared to deal with um, essentially just bad fish? Uh, some of them can look pretty gnarly if the genetics just aren't there. Um, again, some abnormalities, some funky looking fish. If you're prepared to deal with all of our questions, then congrats, you're already a pretty good person, I would say. If you want to continue with this, um, just as your own personal uh, growth as an aquaculturist, go for it. I mean, that's awesome. It's awesome that you have the time, the space, and the resources to get that done. But now I'm going to go get into a bit of more businessy questions, which is kind of what I deal with uh, mostly. Um, so number one is, is it profitable? So with betas, we couldn't keep breeding because there isn't that much high demand for it. Um, at least not something with like guppies or any of the tetras. Everyone always wants to buy 30 tetras, big schools of tetras, and they can go in pretty much any tank. The good news is about that is it's a lot easier to sell a common, easy to keep fish than it is to sell a beta. If you go to any of your PetSmart, Petco, any of your local pet stores, they always have so many betas and what happens to them if no one's able to buy them? You know, like again, are you prepared to deal with loss? Um, maybe you have too many, you're not expecting, uh, you weren't expecting to sell as little as you are. Um, do you have enough room to house your overstock? Um, you know, if some of them die on the shelves or if someone, if you, uh, buy one, uh, if you sell one to someone and their fish dies, are, how are you prepared to deal with that? It's, these are just questions to keep in mind. 
Um, if you're going to breed something for profit, I would go with any of the libraries. Again, a fish that can go in multiple tanks is a profit fish. So any shrimp, shrimp are awesome. People love shrimp. Uh, they can go in a lot of peaceful tanks. But with betas, it's just, it's a lot harder to sell one fish to one person than it is to sell a few fish to a lot of people, if that makes any sense. Alright, so if you think that you're prepared to handle everything, by all means, go ahead. Like I said, uh, we could always use people that are willing to put the time, effort, and money in. Um, if you're ready to deal with loss, that's awesome. If you're ready to deal with any of the struggles that come in the way, anything to uh, have something positive for the hobby. However, if I kind of turned you off on breeding betas, uh, sorry. Um, but there's always other fish that are a lot easier to breed. Again, the guppies, any of the libraries are relatively easy and they're relatively cheap and they're easy to sell. Um, shrimp, neocardinia, bright, colorful, cheap, um, very common, can go in at almost any tank. Um, again, it all just comes down to the water that comes right out of your tap, and space, time, and money, and everything, any of the other questions that I've mentioned before. So I answered, uh, the questions that you needed to answer, anything specific to the betas, I asked uh, Daniel and he did not want to be in this video. He's very shy. I'm sorry, I'm sure we could set up like a forum or a discord where he can answer, uh, answer questions just so you're not taking it from me, so you're taking it from the actual guy that had to deal with all of this and who answered my questions, took the time out of his busy schedule to answer my questions. But essentially, um, getting uh, bettas from any big, uh, any big stores is normally just not a, a, a no-go for breeding just because their genetics are a little wonky. Um, the giant bettas is a recessive gene, kind of like blue eyes. You need to have both to, for it to be a giant betta. It, uh, it comes from the placots. So it just, it's, just expect a very small amount of your bettas when you breed to the, for them to actually be giants. Um, another thing, they're very susceptible to bacterial diseases. Um, he recommends using Artemis uh, just as a preventative. So um, whenever you have fry or just, you know, add it to your arsenal when doing uh, regular maintenance, he says. Um, if you guys have any other questions, feel free to comment. Um, he's ready to answer questions. I'm ready to answer questions. Again, anything just to keep this hobby going and to have more people come in. And it's always exciting to learn something new.